Here we have the La Bali Bay. Latin name is Gordonia lasianthus. And this is a broadleaf evergreen native to coastal regions in the southeastern U.S. This one has a little red spotting and one red leaf, which is normal in the fall and winter for this species. I think the leaves are a little bit more yellow than they might normally be, but I just put this in the ground a few weeks ago. And so far this winter, it's been outside all winter, and we're in early January now, and it hasn't really lost any leaves or had any major um, cold damage, even with some pretty heavy frosts. It didn't really suffer any damage, so I think this may be another tree where the native range suggests that it's not cold hardy, but it actually is cold hardy. And we're really going to get the chance to find out because this week there is an arctic blast coming down that's going to severely test the cold hardiness of this species for its first winter in the ground. And if it survives that, then it's definitely cold hardy. So we'll see Loblolly Bay, how it does. And right next to it I have another tree that falls in pretty much the same category. It grows in the southeastern U.S. coastal regions. This is the Red Bay. Persia Borbonia is the Latin name. And this one looks even better than the other one. It doesn't have the slightest bit of cold damage on any of its leaves, and it's been out in frost so far this winter. So uh, let's see what these two bay trees, they're called bay trees as far as common names go, but obviously they have different genus name, so they're not related. We're going to find out how they do. They can get pretty large in their native range. I doubt they would get that large here in Middle Tennessee, but just growing them and having them survive here would be a triumph in and of itself, even if they never get that big. While we're on the subject of Arctic blasts and flash freezes, I thought it would be a good idea to take a look at some species I'm a little worried about headed into this year's Arctic Blast. Right here we have the Pieris japonica. I forget which cultivar of Pieris this is, but I had a Pieris a little bit smaller than this in the ground last December when it got super cold, and I thought it had survived, but turns out it didn't. So here's attempt number two going into this cold, and I don't think it's going to be quite as severe as last time, but we'll find out. This Pieris put on moderate growth this summer, and you can see all of these red branches where the flowers were. I guess there's some little berries at the end now, but so far so good on Pieris. I've got it growing in a mostly shade, some sun location and it's doing pretty well. Another new plant that I'm trying in the extreme cold this year is the Florida anise. And you'll remember um, it's Elysium floridanum. Last year, if you watched my video about the extreme cold, I had the Elysium parviflorum in the ground, which is obviously in the same genus but a different species, and it did amazingly well. So I'm expecting this Elysium floridanum to weather the single digits with basically no damage. And any damage would be a little bit of a disappointment for uh, something from this genus because the other one performed so well. Here's another broadleafed evergreen. and I just want to take the chance to remind you we are in early January, so uh, it might be easy to forget looking at all these green leaves. This is the um, Leucothui axillaris. Coastal dog hobble is the common name, and um, it was growing pretty good this summer in mostly shade. Uh, you can tell by the needles on the ground that it's under my loblollies, and I'm expecting it to handle the cold pretty well, so we'll see how that goes. I did not have this species in the ground last December during the last Arctic blast, so here's a new experiment. Here's the before, and then we'll take a look at the after in a few weeks. Now here's one little tree that was in the ground last December, the wheel tree, Trochodendron aureliuides, and I thought it was dead. It lost all of its leaves, but then leafed back out this spring. It's got a little bit of 
What I would say is superficial freeze damage on a few of the leaves so far this winter. We'll see what the cold temperatures do this time around, and if it leaves out again, if it happens to lose them all once more. Here's the pyracantha, the smaller one, I have two, and you can see it uh, was frozen back to the ground, but grew incredibly fast, and I would guess it put on about three feet of vertical growth in one growing season after being frozen back to the ground, so pretty impressive for the pyracantha. Obviously the leaves look great in early January, and we'll see how they do once the temperatures hit single digits. Now here's a conifer that I'm also worried about going into the single digits. This is our old buddy Cryptomeria here, Cryptomeria japonica. This cultivar is the um, Arocarioides cultivar of Cryptomeria. And really the only reason I have this is because at the time of the deep freeze last winter, this one was on pre-order, and it didn't arrive until the freezing event had already passed several, I guess maybe a month or two after it had passed. So I received it. Obviously I put it in the ground. It's got a lot of bronzing so far this winter, which is typical for this species. And uh, we'll just see what it does. Um, it's obviously not dead from the bronzing. It just changes color. But last December I had a lot of cryptomerias and they were all killed. And pretty much every cryptomeria in Middle Tennessee, I think, is has, was killed by that same freezing event. So this may be the second blow that finally knocks Cryptomeria out of my collection completely. Needless to say, since last December I have not ordered or purchased any more Cryptomeria. And this is a hybrid Osmanthus, Fortune's Cold Hardy Osmanthus, I believe, which was frozen completely to the ground and everything you see above ground now, which is about two feet high, is regrowth from this past summer. And so we'll see what happens second time around. In the spring I'm going to pick one of these trunks to be the new main trunk and trim away the rest, but I decided to just leave all of the above ground foliage in the winter to see how it handles the cold. This is the Liberty Holly, and you can see it's looking a little worse for wear here. The frosts of November and December have damaged the outermost leaves, but the interior leaves, or interior half of the leaves I should say, seem to be okay and the trunk still looks green, pretty high up on the tree. So last year this was frozen back to the ground by the extreme cold. Let's see if this year it can hang on above ground during the extreme cold. One more new one for this growing season is the Yupon Holly. One commenter said I have nothing to worry about in terms of cold tolerance, so let's find out. This is going to be a real test. And here's one that I'm not that worried about. It's the Inkberry Holly. I like Sclabra. I did not have this in the ground last year, but the species is very cold tolerant, so I would be amazed if it suffers any cold damage. This is the Screenplay Holly, which is a hybrid between Ilex Integra and Ilex Latifolia. And both of those parent species to this hybrid have questionable cold hardiness at best. Then again, here we are in early January and there have been several hard freezes, and I don't see really any cold damage on the foliage. So we'll find out but there is a risk here. This is the Centennial Girl Holly, and last winter it was frozen back to the ground. You can kind of see the stump peeking out behind the foliage there. This year it put on moderate regrowth during the spring and summer. So let's see if second time around the above ground foliage can withstand the cold. And I did not have this species in the ground last December. This is Portuguese laurel, Prunus lusitanica. So far, other than a little damage at the tips, it's held up fairly well this winter. So I've also read online that it's more cold hardy than the English laurel. 
So let's find out. This is going to be an interesting one to watch as well.